Good afternoon and welcome everyone to our last ideal session for 2021, Power, Privilege, Influence and Change. I'm your host, Sal Vergara, Vice President and Managing Director for HRQ here in Dallas. As always, special thanks to uh, our marketing department for orchestrating all the technical aspects and the marketing of today's session. Uh, you just saw the breadth of what Landrum HR and HRQ delivers to our client partners every day. So please let us know if we can be an extension of your HR team to support your DEI, executive leadership coaching, uh, or human capital initiatives. Now, I started these ideal roundtables last year inspired by the social injustice and unrest we've seen over the last year and a half. It's meant to be a platform to advance the dialogue around inclusion, diversity, equity, and authentic leadership, ideal. I've hosted several sessions like this, both for HRQ and for other organizations, uh, and I've been really fortunate to have collaborated with chief DEI officers and leaders from the likes of Nike, Walmart, PepsiCo, uh, Wayfair, Siemens USA, uh, 7-Eleven, PepsiCo, um, Major League Baseball, CBRE, and the NBA, to name a few. Today, I'm honored to assemble a couple of friends and world-class DEI practitioners. My first guest is a restaurant industry veteran with over 15 years of people operations, brand, and technology leadership experience. He currently serves as president for Ann Pizza and is a staunch advocate and ally to the underrepresented. Uh, he's also served on a previous Ideal Roundtable with me before. Please make welcome Mr. Andy Hooper. Uh, my second guest is an accomplished DEI industry speaker and trainer. He's a senior learning and development leader from a small company I think you guys might have heard of called Amazon, and he brings 15 plus years of expertise in talent management, recruiting, sourcing, and learning and development. And he partners with medium to large Fortune 500 companies on learnings designed to overcome bias and create equitable hiring practice. Please make welcome Mr. Kevin Walters. So for the audience, I have a poll question to help give Andy and Kevin and myself some context about general perception about the topic. So you'll see the uh, poll question come up here very shortly. Do you personally feel like you have privilege? So yes, no, indifferent, don't care. So as you are answering those questions, we're tallying the responses. Remember, if you have any questions or comments, please send this uh, to us via the questions panel. I also encourage you to connect with us via LinkedIn. Uh, every registrant will receive a, a link to the on-demand recording of this session. So if you have any questions or would like some guidance or support in building your HR team and or your DEI strategy, please let me know. We'd be happy to help. So we're still getting tallied responses here. Again, do you personally feel like you have privilege? That'll give us some context as we talk about this topic and this session. And as a reminder, if you have any questions, please type that into the questions panel. And we'll do our very best to uh, address those as we, as we talk. So here we go. Do you feel you personally have privilege? The results, yes, 76%, no, 22%, 3% is indifferent, don't care. All right, 76%, yes, 22%, no, the rest, indifferent or don't care. So guys, uh, welcome again. Thank you very much for, for joining me today. Um, let's just get into it. So let's just uh, jump right into it. Now, as context, here is an oversimplified definition of privilege. Privilege is the automatic, taken for granted, inherent advantage each of us has. It's unearned and unseen, but we all have some semblance of privilege. Now, when that word is mentioned, there are generally two very visceral reactions, and the three of us have talked about this. There is denial or defensiveness, or for some folks, the need to fix it. If they feel it, they, they want to address it. So in order to set context for the audience and the rest of our conversation, let's talk about what each of ours is. And if we could start with you, Kevin, what, what your perceived privilege, uh, what, what that is and what that means to you. Yeah, first of all, thanks for having me. Uh, Sal, I want to say that, um, actually, I want to I'll start off lighthearted and say that I don't feel like I have privilege, but that's a joke. I do feel like I have privilege. Actually, my 12-year-old has more privilege than I do. I feel like I dish out a lot of privileges in my home. But for the sake of this argument here, um, yeah, we all have privileges. Some of them are limited, right? Uh, 
depending on your intersectionality and your demographic group. Um, but a lot of our privileges that we don't think of, they're really common privileges that we just take for granted. Mm -hmm. Like the ability to have food on your table, to eat, um, the ability to walk, to be able-bodied, to be healthy, um, owning a home. You know, these are things that in third world countries and even in the United States here, uh, people actually on a daily don't achieve or work towards achieve or may go their entire life and not achieve. So, um, yes, we all have privileges. Um, again, it's very ordinary. So we don't tend to think of we think of the extremities uh, or we think of the groups, you know, the that have a lot of privilege, but we all do. Right. Thank you for your insight. Now, what about you, Andy? Well, I, I'd say that uh, in many respects, as a as a 40 year old white man um, in the United States, I've got uh, just about as much um, privilege as I think I can find in terms of starting off with things that are unearned and just sort of baked into the wood of uh, of my daily life. Um, I'd echo what Kevin said. Uh, you know, I think it's as important to recognize all of these other opportunities uh, that I have, some of which um, are just structural um, and advantages that I have that, you know, change the course that we're on. And that oftentimes, even if my starting position, you know, in a metaphorical race is exactly the same as somebody, the course doesn't quite look the same. And so, you know, when I talk about this with my team, I think one of the most one of the most crucial elements to that is is a level of humility at the beginning to acknowledge that um, even with introspection, there are elements of privilege that 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 I often miss and take for granted. Uh, and just even in hearing Kevin talk, I was thinking about you know serving kids dinner last night and having them reject what was on the table and thinking to myself, man, how much privilege is there that you could say, I don't want to eat this for dinner tonight. And so. I, I think maybe we share that in terms of dishing out privilege in our home, Kevin. Sure. Something as innocuous as that, and we don't really think about it. Um, thank you for that, Andy. And for me, and let me be very clear that I, I don't subscribe to uh, my, what I perceive is the privilege. Uh, I've, I've got almost 30 years of sales and business development experience. In a lot of cases, I have perceived privilege over a female counterpart um, who's just as qualified as I am, if not more, simply because of my gender. And, and I've experienced it live and in person with some of my fellow female colleagues. And it's, it's rather unsettling to see it happening today. Uh, there was an instance where I was with my counterpart in Florida at a conference, uh, and a gentleman came up and asked the question. Um, and my counterpart, that was her part of the, the, the country, he asked the question, but he looked at me. And he deferred to me and I deferred back to her, but everything, all the responses were deferred back to me. So that in and of itself is unsettling. And, and uh, even a more, you know, uh, personal local level, uh, my wife is the more DIY person uh, in this household. We go to a, a hardware store and she'll ask for things and then the individual will look at me. They don't look at her. And so it's that perceived privilege that, I didn't earn it, I didn't ask for it, but unfortunately it's there. And so this conversation will touch upon some, again, some visceral feelings. It, it, the intent here is to defang and demystify, I'm stealing your word, Andy, when we, when we first talked about this topic, is to defang and demystify the word and really kind of come together and, and not to be hokey, but at the end really come to a conclusion of how we can use our perceived privilege uh, to improve uh, the culture and, and really cultivate an ideal environment. So let's go into the questions. In, in thinking about your own privilege that we just talked about, and there's obviously different examples. And remember, audience, it's not self-appointed uh, and everyone, everyone to some degree has privilege over someone else. What do you do to help understand or rationalize how that privilege impacts those around you? In other words, what's the exercise that you go through to empathize. So let's start off with you, Andy. Yeah, um, thanks, Al. I mean, I think for me, this is something that, you know, candidly is still very much a work in progress for me as a leader. Um, I grew up in human resources as a good chunk of my career. And, you know, honestly, like fancy myself to be a fairly empathetic leader. Um, 
but I think one of the things that I still wrestle with a lot on this is, you know, my position in my organization is as the president of the company. And no matter what I think I'm bringing to a conversation from a human perspective, I often have to be reminded, sometimes by my wife, um, that like I'm also in that conversation as the president of the company. And that no matter what I do to try to level the playing field, um, it's not going to be level. And therefore, I can't expect that others are going to approach regular problem solving or a challenge in business with the same level of opportunity that I am. Because at the end of the day, the buck stops with me. And I think for me, probably the most common exercise is trying to examine the ways in which showing up for conversation, I have to do things with intentionality to, to level that playing field. I can't just show up and be my best self because there's still a power structure at play that's going to affect how other people can bring solutions and ideas to the table. And if there are any leaders on the call who lead teams and have sat down and asked their team a question and asked for feedback, and gotten crickets in the room, you know, or had people hesitant to share something you know is on their mind, um, you know, I think it's a good reminder of that power privilege that comes with that position. And I think if you layer on other elements of that, it means that, you know, I shouldn't be looking to the people on my team to break down those power structures and those barriers. I have to recognize that that's my responsibility because ultimately I am the one with the most power to be able to use that for good. So what I'm hearing is self-acknowledgement, be proactive in doing so. Yeah, and I think uh, acknowledgement that uh, that it's okay for, for the action and the requirement of action to fall upon me, right? I can't get everybody together and say, why don't you do more of this? I have to look inwardly and say, what are the things that, at play that might be creating this asymmetry of power that might be, you know, shortchanging an opportunity to get more equity or, or more inclusiveness into that conversation. Of course. Thank you for that. Kevin, what about you? Yeah, for me, um, I'll say, you know, my origin, my parents are from the Jamaica West Indies, and so they're immigrants to this country. I was raised in the South Bronx, and then they moved to the northern part of the Bronx. If anything, anybody knows anything about New York and the South Bronx, it's not a very friendly or um, maybe even civil or livable place for that matter. Um, and I think coming from the humble be you know, beginnings like that and understanding like what I've accomplished today um, keeps me very humble in that sense, hungry, uh, and always, um, I'd say, curious in wanting to be empathetic to others and seek to understand their circumstance and not make quick assessments and judgments and look at a particular demographic group or population and say, well, they should be where they are in this particular circumstance because they're not pulling their themselves up by their bootstraps, so to speak. Um, so limiting assumptions, being open, um, you know, I'm a black heterosexual male that may be privileged in a society that's more male dominant over gay, transgender uh, individuals, right? So there's privileges in each circumstance, but just kind of understanding that even though you are not part of those intersectional groups, you can empathize and at least be open to their struggle or what they're going through. So uh, I think that's really important. And then I think if you're a worldly person like I am, I love to travel. Um, I've always try to uh, see kind of behind the curtain, you know, like when I travel across the world and see what life is really like for people. And that always kind of resets my, um, I'd say, circumstance and understanding that I'm, I'm very privileged even in my current circumstance. Sure. And both of you kind of allude to this in, in your responses. And to, to to your point, Kevin, I think for, for everyone is to give each other grace, uh, especially in this, in this very highly charged uh, environment that we're in politically, culturally. Um, exactly, you know, it's exacerbated why, but what's been happening in the past couple of years is to give each other grace of understanding, as, as Kevin um, uh, alluded to and, and even mentioned, uh, and use the word empathize. I think both of you guys use the word empathize. So uh, give grace. And then also, I'd be remiss to not remind everyone, as you brought that something up, Kevin, is that 
diversity, equity, and inclusion is not just about color and race or ethnicity. It's about um, sexual preference. It's about neurodiverse. It's about former military. So it really encapsulates a whole uh, community or different communities and constituents uh, that we all have to be mindful of. So I think a lot of times we get myopic in our conversation about color and gender and forget about those other uh, constituents. So just a quick reminder um, as we continue the conversation. So next question for, for a lot of the leaders who come to these things and webinars to listen to uh, folks like you, for organizations struggling to broach the topic, you know, they're, they're trying to develop a DEI strategy. You know, how do I start with it? Or if they're in the midst of doing it and they, you know, how do I optimize it? Or even folks who are really going, doing a, a really good job of their DEI strategy. What are some ways to desensitize that word we talked about at the beginning without compromising the true meaning and impact it has in an organization? Kevin, let's start with you. Yeah, this is a complicated one. And, and, and like you said, very sensitive um, because it is, you know, depending on who you are, you may have a visceral reaction to that word, right? Yep. And you know, no one wants to lose the privileges they have. Let's just be honest. The benefits that you have, um, we all would want change, but do we really want change to the point where it means something has to be at a loss of yourself? And that is almost the ultimate contradiction because, you know, you can't have parity and equity um, in those circumstances if you don't give something up. Um, but I think in saying that we all need to uh, I'll go back to kind of what you said about giving grace. Don't feel guilty because of it. Um, no one is necessarily pointing the finger what they like to see, we'd like to see, and, and we should all uh, want is to acknowledge that we all have these privileges and to, to bring awareness to it. Um, so by really just, when you say defang, um, it's just really just acknowledging it, just, you know, not run away from it, don't hide, um, confirm that it exists, discuss it, role play, uh, you know, have discussions, open meetings, uh, listen to other voices in the room that may not necessarily be uh, spoken, outspoken or uh, called on. And yet you know, if you provide a platform for people to really exemplify their feelings and you'll some, you're somewhat desensitizing it, you're not, making it go away. But then mm -hmm. the last thing is to take action and understand that it's not necessarily a, a zero sum game. If we if we focus on one particular demographic group, it doesn't take anything from the other groups, right? We could have parity in those situations as well by bringing equity to others. Right. And I think when you say take action, that just know that there will be there'll be different iterations of that taking action, right? You know, as you work through the, the topic itself and some of the challenges that are inherent with this particular topic and just DE&I in general, I think people get caught up in creating this one strategy and, and just force feeding it to, to make it work. And I think we all agree, at least the three of us here, that there will be different iterations and we have to recalibrate it sometimes uh, to make sure that uh, we accommodate different feelings and as we learn more things uh, to make those appropriate changes. So what about you, Andy? You know, I, something that Kevin said really struck me, which is, um, which sort of made me think about this this concept that was shared with me early in my career, um, a concept called the mood elevator. Um, and basically, it's just like thinking about it as like a vertical representation of your state of mind. Everything from, you know, being depressed, kind of at the bottom of that elevator, all the way up to gratitude at the top. And if you imagine that elevator on the outside of a building, you know, from, from a point of depression, you cannot see very far. Your perspective is pretty limited. But from a point of gratitude on the high floors, the vision you have could be substantial. Depending on how tall that building is, um, you could see the South Bronx from Midtown Manhattan in that example. And I think there's a certain amount of perspective that you have to test as a leader when you're talking about DE&I initiatives in a business to make sure that the state of mind of everyone is is healthy and in a place to examine things with the perspective of curiosity and like for me the flip between curiosity and judgment is very subtle they're kind of like right in the middle of that mood elevator but they sound different judgment sounds like you know this is wrong 
curiosity sounds like, I wonder why. And I think when you're talking about creating real equity and inclusion, you need to make sure that the efforts are against, like, or are in favor of creating a mindset of curiosity where people are able to examine things, not through the point of lens of like feeling like they have to be ashamed of the fact that something exists or feeling like they have to bear the burden of that, but instead saying, what is it about that that's causing that? And I wonder how this might be different if we tweak this little thing here. And I think it, it for me personally, it becomes a lot less daunting for me as a leader if I don't feel like I have to make it all the way to gratitude in order to do this. If I just focus on that flip kind of in the middle there, because the interesting thing about that for me is that state of mind of curiosity leads to a sense of humor, leads to some levity, leads to creativity, and ultimately leads towards gratitude. And I think Kevin's point about being willing to give in order to create parity, that really only happens when you start to get on those higher states of mind, when you can be grateful for what you've got and truly take a look at what you can do to bring others up with you. And so, you know, I, for me, it's less of a specific tactic when implementing things like this and more of a mindset about being clear about where the state of mind of the folks you know, in the room, in the audience, in the company are, and, and the work needs to be done to help sort of create that, till that soil, to create a, a spot where, where that value can be received, uh, because value is in the eye of the receiver, not the giver. Sure. I love that, that concept of nurturing the, a culture of curiosity. I think that opens up a lot of conversation, uh, and it leads to empathy, I think, ultimately. So what's the biggest misconception about how others perceive your privilege? And Kevin, I know you, you mentioned you didn't you jokingly said you didn't feel like you had some, but what, <laughs> what is the biggest misconception uh, when someone looks at you? What do you think that they're thinking? Yeah, um, they're looking at me and they're kind of to what Andy just said in their perspective. Hey, here's a guy who, you know, communicates well, seems successful lives in a nice house um and so they're like what do you have to be concerned about right like where are your struggles right and so i think the biggest misconception to individual privilege is, is, is that um there's no limitations and that all privileges are equal and so we have seen in the past couple of years right uh to 2019 and 2020 george floyd Brianna Taylor and all the different um, atrocities that's happened. And those are extremities on a daily deal basis. We may not experience um, those type of instances or occurrences, but on a regular basis, yeah, we, we all have limitations. And for folks who are higher on that ladder, um, they may go their entire life and not have any experiences, whereas for me, I am very aware of my limitations, and I actually make mental adjustments on a daily basis to, I don't want to say survival instincts, but to be aware of where I am, what I do, how I do it, how I speak. If I want to exemplify my Second Amendment rights, what would I say if I got pulled over by a police officer? Uh, my interactions with my uh, daughters, teachers at school, how I communicate with executives internally, my peers, how I dress, how authentic I am. And these are things that I think non-diverse or other demographic groups in their comfort zone, let's just be honest, may not ever think about. Yep. It's just an ordinary day and they never have to stressfully worry about these conditional factors that can affect them. And I'm always... Um, somewhat surprised sometimes when I'm in uh, and when I'm doing these sessions or we're doing uh, role plays with individuals and we're sharing exper experiences and they've never and, and some folks have never had uh, uh, adverse experience in any particular area. I'm almost like, wow, what would that world be like for me? Right. If I didn't have to think about that if I could wake up every day and just be ordinary. Yep. And those are big, that, and, and it's, it's not just isolated to you. I mean, millions of people experience it, and uh, it's not easy to articulate all that. So thank you for doing that. Andy, what about you? What's the biggest misconception about how others perceive your privilege? Um, 
you know, I think for me, it, I can empathize with your story a bit about being in the hardware store because I'm married to the more um, able-bodied home improvement half in in my home. Um, but I think like the the issue underneath that, the probably the most common misconception is is in my confidence or my competency that somehow because of who you know how I show up and the role that I play at work and you know, the privilege that I have, um, you know, that somebody is assuming that I am the person best suited to answer that question or to engage in that. And candidly, like that's sometimes tricky for me because leading a team and trying to help train people towards the person or the group or, or the beneficiary that needs to be there and always being the one to redirect um, can be tricky. And, and I think that, you know, that's something that people sort of commonly mistake is that they're think, oh, well, you know, you, you have the position power or you have the life experience or you have this other thing, like you should be the expert on this. And I'm like, no, 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 you, you need to talk to, you need to talk to this woman over here. You need to talk to this man over here. You need to talk to my kids on this. Um, and, and I think that that's, that's something that I'm aware of. And, and, Honestly, it's it's an interesting playback about how much those power structures are at play in life and sort of just like hidden amongst everything else. The fact that that person in the hardware store would look at you instead of your wife, Sal. I mean, like I was having a toilet fixed earlier this summer. My wife called the plumber, made the appointment, scheduled it, managed him. And then at the end, he came to talk to me about the bill. And, and she was like, you got to be kidding me. And Yep. And I think there there are just those moments in life um, and in work where it's pretty clear that uh, that there's some misconceptions about about that that are driven by that privilege. And this is a question that it, it, there's no good answer. I mean, how do we get to a point where that's no longer and maybe that maybe it'll be never. I, I'm hoping that's not the case. But how do we get to the point where it's not def that deference isn't innate like that doesn't always happen? What needs to happen? <laughs> I, I, uh, I think effort, right? There needs to continue to be intentionality to to try to take that apart. I think, you know, being overwhelmed by the by the sheer size or volume of that, instead of breaking it down to those little moments of curiosity, for me, that's where leaders uh, get stuck is they see that thing and they're like, wow, that's that's going to take so much effort to dismantle or to restructure or to affect change and not doing anything, especially when you are in a position of power, um, is the worst possible thing to do. Um, you know, being concerned with with it being perfect or that somehow you're going to lose credibility for being ham handed or clumsy about it. Uh, and then choosing not to do anything at all, well, you're basically just sort of resigning to the fact that that that's going to be the case. And I think that's where that's where there's so much value in building diverse teams, because if you if you're really empowering people to speak up and watch your blind spot as leaders, yep. they're not going to let you be inactive on that. And I think that's for me, that's the key. If you if I imagine a world, Sal, where where that is not innate anymore, like the only way that happens is if we keep moving forward, if we keep chipping away at it and we keep trying to create places where people can express their questions and concerns in a way that allows them to grow, that allows me to grow as a leader. And and I think, you know, maybe that's maybe that's an uh, too unspecific of an answer, but I think the key is 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 momentum, movement, sure. forward progress, not you know, getting caught up and letting perfection get in the way of that progress. Don't let perfect get in the way of really good. And and something that all the panelists have, have said, just get started. I know it's an arduous, daunting task, as Andy alludes to. Uh, it'll be painful in the beginning, but it's a matter of getting started. And you brought up a good point of leaders surrounding them with folks that will call out their blind spots. So we'll help keep an eye out for that. From a, a executive leadership coaching uh, perspective, that's something that I always uh, I'm mindful of is is surrounding myself with folks that will remind me of those blind spots. And I think this big topic, DEI of itself, specifically this topic of, of privilege, um, I think you you hit it uh, the nail on the head is creating the, those diverse and inclusive cultures to help cultivate that. And it it'll take time. 
in, it's utopic in, in, in thinking about it, but I think we can get there if we try. So, um, so having privilege doesn't mean that the individual is cheating in the game of life or hasn't put the work in to deserve what he or she has. I think we've established that. I think this point is really important. In fact, I think it breaks down the term privilege the best, in my opinion. The difference is that certain experiences, and I think you kind of, one of you mentioned this earlier, the difference is that certain experiences for others that are seemingly mundane or innocuous for you are much different and often challenging for others. So some things that we do on a daily basis, it's no big deal, it happens, but for others, it, it's an arduous task. Give us an example of that for you and how you na navigate to level that playing field. Kevin, what do you think? Yeah, I have one that um, comes to mind most recently. Um, I had a major surgery, I had hip surgery, and that was, you know, something I had never done before. So uh, the rehab and rehabilitation process was, of course, had its challenges, but it really brought home and had me think about on a daily basis, you know, folks that are disabled mm -hmm. and I'm an able-bodied individual. I'm healthy. I was in that temporary uh, spectrum, so to speak, for a period of time. But on a regular basis, there are folks that struggle with, you know, just getting from point A to point B and would walk in and in a wheelchair and have permanent disabilities. And I actually notice the difference in how people paid attention to me as I went to the grocery store on my walker or cane um, versus walking. And it made me be more empathetic to that population in that case and want to do something um, as far as sharing resources and, and being more inclusive in my training and talking about uh, the disabled and, and able-bodied um, population. I think it's important. Sometimes we focus on the larger groups, but we don't focus on, you know, some of these other areas, right? So it's, 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 all about perspective, depending on what your personal circumstance or situation is, right? If someone in your family has cancer, you may be more prone to pay attention to that population. But I think we need to stretch ourselves um, and just think just across the lines. Again, it's not so ordinary for everyone. And we should right. be looking kind of sideways and seeing, oh, you know what? These are some of the privileges I have and, and how can I help in other areas and be a voice to those individuals. Absolutely. That's a great example. I've never thought of that analogy, but thank you for that. What about you, Andy? Yeah, something that's been sort of front and center for me and for my organization um, for the last you know, 20 months or so now um, is just basic transportation safety and security. So, you know, I have a lot of hourly workers that work um, at specific pizza shops. And when COVID hit, um, you know, there was... I think I, I personally took for granted the fact that I didn't have to get in my car and go anywhere, right? Like I wasn't, I wasn't to be able to perform the duties of my job required to go subject myself to a lot of the unknowns out there in the world at the time. And, you know, I wasn't riding a city bus or taking the Metro. I wasn't having to be on the front line serving people without a whole lot of awareness about what was going on, um, you know, with, with early stage pandemic health and safety protocols. Um, you know, and, and as I watched my team, I think I learned a lot about the ways in which like just something as simple as my commute uh, doesn't doesn't have any real consideration. I don't have to think about which direction I'm going to drive or what happens on the way there or if I'm taking a city bus, you know, how to get how to be safe in that environment or whether somebody's going to do something to me on that. Uh, and it 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 helped us as an organization um make some changes uh we partnered with lyft early on to expand transportation benefits to our family members to get them to and from the shop um wow. so that they would not have to put themselves in harm's way you know in in you know public transit scenarios or in in parts of town where they might be left waiting outside for half an hour in order to get from point a to point b because of reduced you know metro schedules and I think, you know, those are the situations where we try to listen and try to really pay attention to the feeling, you know, to, to, to not having a feeling about something like not having to think about my commute and having somebody 
you know, reach forward and say, hey, look, I know you don't have to think about these things, but I do. I have to think about whether I'm safe in this part of town, you know, for 20 minutes um, on the transfer or whether I'm going to get sick on the bus, you know, and, you know, it's nice that you don't have to worry about that, Andy, but like, I got to think about that. And I think, it, you know, those types of moments end up really pointing out the pockets of privilege that exist that aren't as front and center, that aren't as obvious, that aren't talked about as often, but that when, 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 you know, broken down a bit and supported by the organization can yield real benefit. And, you know, when you said, you know, how you guys are talking about your routines and kind of having to alter something or not, that one really stuck out for me because I heard that a lot from my team and it caused us to make some changes accordingly. And it's a great, those uh, two examples are, are great examples of how just the most mundane things that we don't really think about. And like you said, there are other uh, scenarios that are more front and center, but things like this for audience members that if you're struggling uh, to identify things within your own organization, maybe something that you've not thought of. So thank you very much for bringing the, the, those uh, examples up. And, and I think oftentimes we as allies and advocates, we automatically rush to fix the situation. I think that's just inherent in our our roles and just as individuals, when in reality, one of the most important things uh, that we can do is to listen to those who feel underrepresented, discriminated, or marginalized. And so what's the best way to leverage privilege to affect positive change? We, we've been talking about it here, different examples, but can you give an example of what you're doing either in your organization or even in your community to help change that? Kevin? Yeah, this one is kind of falls within my wheelhouse because of the work that I do on a regular basis. Um, being a public speaker, DEI trainer, learning and development leader, um, personally being almost tasked with the responsibilities of helping others learn how to engage and communicate and really identify members from underrepresented communities um, on a regular basis, just bring awareness to the groups that don't necessarily get a lot of media attention or publicity for me. Um, obviously, we we all hear about, to some degree, the black struggle or the struggles in the Latinx or the Asian community, but you don't hear a lot about the indigenous community. You may not hear a lot about transgenders. Um, you may not hear about a lot about LGBTQ in general, although I think today we're seeing more awareness around, around that too. Um, so really just educating, bringing awareness and helping folks understand, again, I want to go back to something I said earlier about this guilt. It's it's not about whether you're good or not. It's not about, you know, that you're a bad person. The extremities of what we've seen, say, in Brunswick, Georgia, is not the day-to-day -day lives of a lot of people in the marginalized community. Maybe a good percentage of the population in one particular population, yes, but we're not really talking about it. We're just talking about the things that you could do on a regular basis to impact change. When you see something or you hear a joke that's insensitive or racially uh, um, motivated, um, being silent, not doing something about it, using your voice, because a lot of times uh, that other voice may not be in the room. Right. right? Um, and if that person or individual feels very comfortable with sharing uh, negative experiences or saying something, uh, racial or, or making a bad joke or insensitive about a, a underrepresented uh, individual, this is your opportunity to, to, it could be a learning opportunity for you to speak up and say, hey, you know, I don't think that was appropriate. Um, and really putting forth a voice for those folks. So on a regular basis, I try to ensure that everyone has somewhat of a platform in the things that I do. Um, you know, and not just being focused on the demographic group that I'm a part of. Absolutely, great point, great point. Andy, what about yourself? You know, I think for me, there are two keys that I try to employ here to to be able to leverage my privilege for, for moving this forward. The first is uh, making an explicit statement to my team that I want to create an environment that is inclusive. Uh, I think just starting and by saying that and, and saying to everyone, you know, you have the permission to call foul, you know, to Kevin's point, if you're in a conversation, um, you know, 
to be able to to be the ally and to be able to recognize when when things are happening that are that are running counter to that espoused goal. Um, and the second is to do regular check-ins and listen and examine the things that exist and how they got there to make sure that there aren't underlying structural you know elements of that that are discriminatory in some way. And in you know I think early on in my career I had a very different perspective about how important it was to do that formally. I sort of was like, what do you mean? Like, you know, people have the same opportunity. Like, isn't this merit based? You know, um, and I don't know how much of that was was being 18 or 20, how much of that was being a man, how much of that was being white, how much of that was being, you know, from a from a middle class family or how much of that was being naive. I think it was probably all of those things. Um, but I think today. The, the key is for me, you know, being explicit about my intentions and giving people permission to be able to help, you know, grab a shovel in that. And, and it, it doesn't always work well. I'll be, you know, I'll be honest, like I'm not, I don't get it right all the time. You know, I have a couple of women on my team um, who are direct reports who will routinely say, like, I can't get a word in, in this conversation. Like you have to do a better job of creating an environment where I can share my perspective or, you know, this person keeps trying to tell me how to do their, do my job and it's offensive. Like this is my role. Like I'd like to be able to speak about it. And while that conversation is uncomfortable with me and, and, you know, I might feel like I'm failing as a leader in a moment like that, that's really important for me because if those leaders won't come forward and say, Hey, this is happening or, Hey, you're sort of falling away from what you're saying you're trying to create. Um, then, then it settles into the status quo that Kevin was mentioning. And so, for me, those have been two keys, um, you know, creating that environment explicitly and then nurturing it in terms of being open to people telling you when, when things are not on track. Right. And really just the fortitude to have to, if you see something, say something. And it's easier said than done. Um, we can philosophically talk about it, but actually doing it can be, uh, it can put you in a bad spot. It could be uh, elicit visceral reactions uh, on the spot. And, uh, I think that we have to get to a point where we do have the internal fortitude to, to say something um, to get it started. And, and I hear this a lot, so kind of segue to the next question. Uh, I hear this thing a lot, especially from those who aren't necessarily categorized as underrepresented, um, that people should just get over it. You know, let's just move on. And, and the intent and the, the sentiment is like, let's get to where we need to go, but just get over it. Let's just move on. How do you diplomatically explain that it's just not that simple of saying, yeah, just we'll move on, just get over it, Kevin? And I, I know there'll be probably two different answers just from the perspective, the obvious perspective of the difference here uh, in both of you, but interested to hear what, what your, your thoughts are. Just get over it. What do you say to that? Yeah. Um, you know, I think being someone part of the underrepresented population, we'd like to, right? Uh, I'll speak personally, you know, I'd love to get over it. I'd love to be ordinary, so to speak. Uh, you keep using that. But I'll throw some stats out here. You know, 3% of senior corporate leadership in America is held by black people. Uh, we represent 12.5% of the US population, 4% for Hispanics, 18% Hispanic population. I think within FANG, um, We've seen the stats, the needle has moved what, in the past four years, there's still been like 1% representation for underrepresented across the board. Uh, we could talk about, you know, comparisons with police shootings around, among demographic groups, percentage wise, those numbers. Um, we could look at the legislative uh, demographic um, makeup of the House and the Senate and the Congress. We could look at our past presidents. Um, systematically, it's hard to get over these things when they're very apparent and we live in somewhat even almost in a segregated world, right? A lot of folks really live amongst themselves in their own population. So they're not subject to seeing what the other struggles of those other uh, diverse underrepresented groups are on a daily basis. They go to uh, church with folks who are similar to them right they may go to have the same their kids go to the same type of schools they live in neighborhoods that are very similar so from that perspective when you're the dominant group um it's easy to say get over it unfortunately 
that is also the group that holds the power structure. And they're enforcing and keeping that power structure in place to receive all the, these unearned and earned benefits that we speak of. So it's, it's, I think we'd love to get to a place again of parity and I'm optim somewhat optimistic and hopeful, but also understand that um, it's really systematic and it's institutionalized across the board. And so it's hard to get over it in all these different instances when it's apparent in each one of the um, structures of our society. Thank you for that, Kevin. Andy? Yeah, I'm not sure I can say it much better than that. Um, well, I, actually, I should say that positively. I can't say it any better than that. Um, but the one thing that I would say in support of it is, you know, the people in power are the ones that can make that change. And so if, if there's anyone who has the mindset of, man, can't we just get beyond that? Uh, almost always, those people are going to have their hands on the steering wheel. And so the irony is we can get there a lot faster the more bold those people are. The more bold I am uh, in my position of power and privilege, the faster it gets to, you know, utopia, the faster it gets to a place where there's true equity. And so if I ever feel a tinge of, man, I'm tired, why can't this just be done yet? You know, I got to look in the mirror because I've got I got a lot of things that are in my control or influence to accelerate that timetable. I think it sounds great to to say be bold. I mean that's uh, that's really the basic sentiment and uh, to to have that internal fortitude. But it's not easy, right? It's it's uh, you're going up against tradition and um, ways of doing things that are very difficult to 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 change overnight. And I think that just comes back to uh, the the conversation of just getting started and there, you, you, you're going to have to recalibrate and redefine strategies as you go, and you're going to foul up. You're going to uh, go through a lot of um, uh, instances or iterations. But the, the main thing that that we all think about is that this is um, it's a marathon. Uh, for another lack of a better analogy, um, it's it's a, a shift uh, of culture. And uh, I think it takes everyone really to put a, a proactive effort into it. So as, as audiences come to these things, they're looking for practical, tactical and strategic help in, in creating a DEI strategy and also advancing the dialogue around DEI and, and, and this topic in and of itself. What's one tip to help our audience begin the conversation to defang, demystify the word and work towards a more harmonious, ideal environment? And it's a broad question, but what's the one thing that something that can be, I don't want to say easy because nothing's easy, but what's a good fundamental step, regardless of where you are, again, in, in your DEI strategy, and regardless if you are a startup or 85,000 employees worldwide, what's a good place to start, Kevin? Yeah, if you want to not get real methodical and get real intentional about what you can do, I would say uh, the best way to lead these conversations is to utilize data and, you know, lead with data, the numbers, the metrics. If you're looking, if you're being authentic um, and you want to have a courageous conversation um, internally, that's, that's how you're going to be able to do it and, and show and say, hey, X looks like this. And we want to be at Y. And um, why do we want to be at Y is the other thing we'd want to understand. Like, what is it about us that would make, um, open, when we open our doors, people want to be a part of our organization? Um, you know, it, it, it's it's our ironic a lot of times when um, I know other folks, I've heard this in talking to candidates and such, um, when companies say, hey, yeah, we're diverse and, you know, we're open to underrepresented communities and we know that there's a struggle to build these talent pools and such but then when you go to their website you don't you don't really see anyone that looks like you or you don't see um any i'd say um you know media or any communities or any um thing that really speaks to really other communities 
it doesn't make you look, it look, makes you look disingenuous. It doesn't make you look welcoming and it's not inviting. Um, I think to what Andy's saying that, you know, you have to roll up your sleeves and get in the trenches and listen to your audience and listen to what they want, not so much what you think they want. And that's also part of the challenges, whose voice is being represented, right? Is it the voice at the top? Um, again, holding that power structure in place and saying, hey, I think you guys need this, right? Or is it the people within the company that's really driving uh, those initiatives and saying, hey, this is what we need for us. And that's all part of the empathy. And it's, it's it may sound, you know, easy, but it's not an easy thing to do. It, 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 there's going to be power shifts. There's going to be uh, struggles. They're gonna, there's there's going to be uncomfortableness. But I think that's all part of uh, being a change agent and being a part of, uh, you know, the diversity and equity inclusion conversation. Absolutely. Thank you, Kevin. Andy? Yeah, my tip is actually more of a more of just kind of a rhetorical question for attendees, um, which is, you know, what does this moment in history provide us as an opportunity to reimagine how we've approached this? You know, I, there's, I think about things like um, neurodiverse and, and disabled professionals and what a remote work environment does, for example, to open wide open the ability to imagine how to include those people and bring their talents to the table. Like that's just, this is a moment in time where no longer can somebody say, well, you gotta be in the office for 40 hours a week and you gotta be here Monday to Friday from nine to five or, or whatever that looked like before. I think for a lot of folks, myself included, now represents a really interesting moment to reimagine the way in which we approach DE&I without the constraints that existed before. You know, like if you want big change and bold moves, having having the nature of work be upended can be both daunting because it's tough to drive inclusion, period, when you're not face to face. I, don't, I mean, I have felt that myself with my existing team. You don't have the same tools at your disposal to drive true inclusivity from an emotional perspective. But the flip side of that is it opens up a huge amount of possibility that may not have existed before. And and so I think that's the tip, which is if you're looking to get started or if you're in early stages of starting, or maybe even if you're mature and you've got a consummate professional leading the charge for your multi-billion dollar company like Kevin is for his, um, there's still a new opportunity to to be even better afforded to us by this moment in history. And And I don't have the answer yet for how. I just know that it would be impossible for there to not be opportunities in this, given how disruptive it has been. And you know, when you look at the number of people who were actively searching for employment last month when the, when the jobs report came out, it's pretty clear right now that the power and the control is shifting from those at the top to the hands of the workers. And while we were on this call, you know, the, the union voted to certify Starbucks in Buffalo, New York today. And, you know, like, that's a big moment in labor and in workers' rights um, and in sort of shifting the way in which we think about that. And so for everybody here, I think it, it's an important reminder that there's opportunity right now to reimagine the way that we do this and, and we should take it. If we're really committed about building inclusivity, we should leverage uh, the creativity that we've got to do more right now, given, given what the world has given us. Absolutely. And and key words that, that still resonate with me, as you mentioned it, uh, to, to reimagine new ways of doing things, to be empathetic and to give grace. I think that's kind of the fundamental basic things to think about as we go through this journey of DE&I. Uh, we're about uh, right near the, the top of the hour. So we'd love to take this opportunity to respond to any questions uh, we didn't get to earlier. I don't see anything here uh, in front of me right now, but if you do come up with a question that uh, you were hesitant to ask, or if something comes up afterwards, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. We will answer you. We will get responses back. Kevin and Andy will give their their uh, perspective. Um, obviously, this has been an honor and has proved to be both educational and thought provoking as always. And when I speak to you folks, uh, Kevin, is there anything that you're working on that exciting that you'd like to share with the group? It doesn't necessarily have to be DEI related, but you know, tell uh, the folks a little bit about uh, your your work that you do. Yeah, 
Um, I'm just always uh, a student of the game. I know you've heard that, you know, I'm always involved in learning and being passionate in reading um, and watching videos. Uh, I was watching something by Dr. Jacqueline Battalore, if you've heard her name, Jane Elliott, um, uh, you know, doing trainings, uh, working with small, medium co corporations. It's such a, I'd say, one of the things that I'm excited about is that it's a good time to get into the space, but also it's a good time to also be an educator and a learning and development professional because it allows me the opportunity to not only share my personal experiences, but to really help others bridge some of the gaps out there and, and really learn, right? And so if you're hesitant or you're afraid and saying, oh, well, you know, I'm not sure if this is something I should be doing, I would say jump forward, you know, uh, reach out to me, uh, love to talk with you uh, when I have time and, you know, set up a call, whatever it is, but really a lot of my time is spent just, I'm, I'm, I'm passionate about this for obvious reasons, but just really trying to learn as much as I can. And no one can master it all because we're, it's a pretty big world out there. <laughs> right. Thank you, Kevin, for that. Two questions just popped up, if you guys don't mind here. What do you tell people who respond to privilege with, no one gave me anything. I've worked hard for what I have. Everyone else should too. Andy, what do you think about that? Uh, you know, when, when, it's, when, yeah, when, when sentiment like that is shared, I try to sort of parse out the fact that there are plenty of things that people have earned. And I try to acknowledge that. I mean, you know, it, if somebody goes to school for four years and graduates with a degree and has worked hard to get through that and they've earned that, that degree, I try to point out, yeah, that's, you, you earned that. Like, I, and no one should take that away from you. I think uh, instead though, there's a flip to that, which is there are elements of that paradigm that, that, you know, that, that you might've gotten that you didn't earn that puts you in that position to begin with. And I think the key is, it, it, that's where I come back to that defang, you know, kind of description, Sal, that I mentioned the first time we talked about this, which is kind of taking the personal affront out of privilege. This yeah. idea you can be both privileged and ambitious. You can be both privileged and capable. You can be privileged and empathetic. Um, and those are not mutually exclusive descriptors. And so, I think for me, when someone says, I've, you know, everything I have, I deserve or I've earned, you know, I try to sort of pull that apart a bit and, and acknowledge where, in fact, there's been real earned, you know, accomplishment and celebrate that. And then also then from that point of view, usually that brings them up the mood elevator enough to where they've got at least curiosity to say, now, what elements of that do you think maybe just sort of happened for you, um, you know, that puts you in that spot? I think that's a great way of, like you said, distilling that that term and that question and, and uh, taking the sting out of it is, is kind of breaking that apart. So thank you for reminding me of that conversation and, and really for the audience to hear that. The Another question that came in, something similar, is privilege unearned if it's in the form of a level of education? The concept of earning a degree, especially for individuals who don't come from educated backgrounds. What do you think about that, Kevin? Is privilege unearned if it's in the form of level of education? Yeah, I mean, education is a uh, is is not easily available to everyone, and so uh, how far you go up that ladder is going to be dependent on your social economic status, where you live. Okay. Uh, if you live in a lower income area, those schools are not as 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 well funded as uh, schools in high income areas. Um, so when you look at education and, and how systematically it's set up, yeah, it's you're essentially set up for success, right? Based on your environment and where you come from. Um, sure. Now, how you end up is a different story and we're, we're not questioning those earned abilities and privileges that you have. What we're talking about is the inherent ones that systematically continue to be in place that are barriers to other people that may not have the ability to get there or you know systematically are prevented and prohibited from getting there 
Um, and just asking these questions, audience members, it, it, the fact that you're bringing this up, it, this is the first step in, in creating that dialogue around defanging, demystifying, not just the word privilege, but just DE&I in general. And I think this conversation is, it's not about shame. It isn't about assigning blame or guilt, but more so around the responsibility shared by all. In order for us to progress and develop, we do have to revisit the past, as uncomfortable as that can be. But in doing so, let's recalibrate our focus on moving forward and galvanizing the idea of unity. So on behalf of HRQ, Landrum HR, and the audience, Andy and Kevin, thank you for spending your afternoon with us and your continued efforts in the advancement of an ideal culture. Audience, please take a moment to answer the survey as you exit the webinar. Please be on the lookout for information on my next Ideal Roundtable sessions for 2022. Let's bridge the gap, be more empathetic, and truly build an ideal environment. For HRQ Landrum HR, I'm Sal Vergara. Until next time, elevate yourself and those around you.